Dear friends, good evening and welcome. <laughs> As we begin, I want to acknowledge and thank our program committee chaired by Dr. Claudia Plattel, tonight staffed especially by Lee Robbins and Fred Roden, but they work very closely, as we know, with Dr. Mark Weistuck, our librarian, Liza Stabler, and over the course of this year, they have created so many extraordinary opportunities for us, and I certainly want to thank Mark Heitlinger and his staff for making all of those opportunities actually come to pass. This moment is not only a professional thrill, but to welcome tonight's honored guest, Rabbi Dr. David Ellenson, is a very personal joy. And as I welcome him, I want to uh, welcome also our Rabbi Emeritus, Dr. David Posner, who is a governor of the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of <laughs> David. And with him, Mrs. Sylvia Posner, who is not just the Rebbitson of this congregation, but for so many years was Rabbi Ellenson's great support during his presidency at the College Institute and now plays that same role for the new president of the college, Aaron Penkin. So David, Sylvia, very wonderful to welcome you. There are other governors here uh, in addition to, uh, to Dr. Posner who are members of our congregation. John Golden here with his wife Suzanne and Fran Hess, two of them. Our members are on the Board of Governors as well. So it's nice to all be together to celebrate um, our wonderful Rav. Rabbi Dr. David Ellenson is now the Chancellor of the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, having just completed truly a remarkable tenure as the College Institute's president. He is the IH and Anna Grantzell Professor of Jewish Religious Thought. He's internationally recognized for his publications and research, especially in the areas of theology and philosophy, ethics, and modern Jewish history. He received his doctorate from Columbia in 1981 and was ordained by HUCJIR in 1977. He's a fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem and a fellow and lecturer at the Institute of Advanced Studies at Hebrew University. Rabbi Ellenson's extensive publications include Tradition in Transition, Orthodoxy, Halakha, and the Boundaries of Modern Jewish Thought, Rabbi Ezreal Hildesheimer and the Creation of a Modern Jewish Orthodoxy, which was nominated for the National Jewish Book Council's Award for Outstanding Book in Jewish History, Between Tradition and Culture, The Dialectics of Jewish Religion and Identity in the Modern World, after Emancipation, Jewish Religious Responses to Modernity, which won the National Jewish Book Council's Award as the Outstanding Book in Jewish Thought, and Pledges of Jewish Allegiance, Conversion Law and Policy Making in 19th and 20th Century Orthodox Responsa, co-authored with Daniel Gordas, and I know utilized as a text um, by Fred Roden during his teaching. So that's what Dr. Ellenson's official biography will tell you. But as I began to say when he spoke to us in the fall, what those of us who were students in his classroom will tell you is that Dr. Ellenson is simply the most extraordinary human being, the most extraordinary visionary, and Rav, whose ability to articulate a response to the challenges of modernity is grounded in the profoundest aspirations of our prophetic heritage and the highest scholarship, and most of all, the deepest, deepest love for the Jewish people. When you sit and you listen to him speak of Abraham Joshua Heschel, you really glimpse Heschel's vision of what the world might yet be. And when you watch him weep when speaking of Leo Beck's heroism comforting the inmates of Theresen, you really understand what it means to love your people. So David is a very special force in my life and in the Jewish world. Tonight's program is part of this extraordinary series on the history and future of Reform Judaism, which he kicked off last fall when he took us back to the 19th century to two divergent approaches to Jewish religious reform as we examined the philosophies of Isaac Mayer Wise and David Einhorn. And I don't think I actually showed them to you, but we actually have busts of both 
Einhorn and Wise in the temple, and I had wanted them to actually be right here on either side of you, but I was told they were too heavy. Um, so your bust is next. We're gonna <laughs> tonight. <laughs> Paper mache, no. Tonight, we're going to explore with Dr. Ellenson great currents of 20th century Judaism. We'll look at the Holocaust, the rise of the state of Israel, the acculturation of the children and grandchildren of Jewish immigrants to the United States, and the rise of intermarriage and the full acceptance of Jews into American society, and how these forces have influenced and transformed our reform movement, and what, because of all of those currents, the future might yet hold. So it is a truly great joy to welcome back to Temple Emmanuel my beloved teacher, Rabbi Dr. David Ellenson. Erev Tov, good evening. Uh, can I stand like this too? Do people hear or do I need the microphone? Microphone. Okay, I wasn't sure because I had this one, uh, how it stood. Anyway, it is always a great pleasure to be here, and I particularly uh, am overjoyed to see so many of my uh, friends who are here, and that includes uh, not only the people who are on the Board of Governors, but I would say with uh, Sylvia Posner here, uh, working with her for over a dozen years. The fact is we've known each other far more than a dozen years. To look at her, you would never know that uh, so many years have passed, but uh, certainly for more than a dozen years when I was president of the Hebrew Union College, and for all of you who know Sylvia Posner, uh, I could say that at best I worked with, I was about to say that I worked for Sylvia, but worked with, I think, is probably the best way to, uh, to phrase it. It is really a great pleasure. Uh, to speak to this topic tonight, too, I, I do have to comment, Josh, that when I hear you read uh, some of the books that I've written with those kinds of titles, I do want to say if we have any investors here who would like to turn any of these works into movies, uh, how should I phrase it? Uh, they're still really open. No one has yet scooped them up in any, uh, in any significant way. It just reminds me, too, and I may have said this last time, when my mother read one of my books, and they always have terms like between tradition and culture, dialectic, uh, orthodoxy, halakha. Uh, my mother, who loved me infinitely, infinitely, looked at the first paragraph or two of one of my books and said only in the way that a mother could, uh, and Fred, I'm particularly grateful to you for using it uh, with your student. Uh, she said, a lot of people don't read this, do they? Uh, and I said, well, a lot may not, but if you're interested in issues like the reaction of the Hungarian Orthodox rabbinate in the 1860s to apostates, you will read what I have written for more than 100 years because it is unlikely that anyone else will write an article on that exact uh, topic. I will add that my daughter Ruth, who wrote a book entitled The I think it's something like The Modern Jewish Girl's Guide to Guilt, and I, of course, played a major role in her being able to articulate it in this, uh, this way. Her book sold a little bit more than uh, my half dozen books altogether, to put it rather uh, mildly. But let's talk about uh, where American Judaism and the reform movement have gone over the 20th century and where we are likely to go in the future. By the way, I always like engaging in prognostication. Uh, I like it particularly because I cannot be empirically disconfirmed, uh, at least at the moment when I tell you what the future will be, uh, because the events haven't yet unfolded. That's all to say that attempting to predict what the future will hold is often a very tricky business. On this score, I always remember as a boy Look Magazine in the 1960s, some of you may remember, had a major article entitled The Vanishing American Jew. I always loved that uh, particular issue of that magazine 
And if we consider this, uh, and now it's more than 50 years later, the Jewish people are still here. Look Magazine is not. Uh, so it tells you something, excuse me, about the nature of the future when one tries to predict it. Uh, In order to understand where American Judaism has gone in the 20th century in general, and the reform movement in particular, we have to view it against the backdrop of what it meant when a huge Eastern European Jewish migration came to the United States between 1881 and 1924. The last time I spoke, and in your series, I talked about Rabbi Wise and Rabbi Einhorn against the backdrop of what is called in American Jewish history the period of Germanic Jewish hegemony. It's called the period of Germanic Jewish hegemony in the 19th century because up to 1881 virtually all the Jews in North America were of Germanic descent and they spoke the German language. Uh, at the end of the Federalist period of American Jewish history, there were approximately 3,000 Jews in North America. While the Sephardim dominated, and we have a sister synagogue across the park that traces its origins back to that point, the reality is that the German Jews, German-speaking Jews who came in the 18 10s, 20s, 30s, 40s, through 1881, outnumbered the Sephardic Jews 80 to 1 during that period demographically. What is also significant to note is that Eastern European Jews who came to the United States from 1881 to 1924 numbered about two and a quarter million. So they began to outnumber the German Jews uh, quite significantly, uh, almost 10 to 1 during that period. In order to understand the directions of reform in the American Jewish community in the 20th century, I want to begin by talking about the cultural characteristics of these Eastern European Jews and what their aspirations were. I want to talk about some of the leaders who played the most significant role in shaping the direction of reform in the 20th century, and I will focus specifically on Rabbi Stephen S. Wise, and then move to the Holocaust events of the 1960s, the rise of ethnic awareness uh, among Americans, and then begin to consider the rise of intermarriage and where we are today. And I promise you I'll do all of this in 45 to 50 minutes. I am always happy to say on such occasions it would take note, if you think I leave anything out or give short shrift to any significant point, I can assure you already you are correct about that. It is a lot to cover in one lecture, but I hope I will be able to emphasize it. First point I want to note about the Eastern European immigrants who came to North America, if you want to understand the directions of reform. Most of us live with a popular myth. How many of you think, who are descended from Eastern European Jews, that your grandparents and great-grandparents were Orthodox? If you were to ask. Yeah, that is actually one of the greatest myths of American Jewish history. Most of our ancestors who came from Eastern Europe were traditionalist in their orientation. That is to say, they were the products of Eastern European Jewish folk culture. They had certain attitudes towards Judaism that I'll talk about in a moment. But the reality is they were not orthodox, if by orthodox one means that they had a complete commitment to the observance of halakha. And I want to demonstrate this in a few ways. Uh, and it is important because it means that their penchant, their desire when they came to North America was to acculturate and participate in American Jewish life and American life no less than the German Jews who preceded them. An Orthodox lifestyle is generally marked by several major commitments in terms of life practice observances. One is, of course, the observance of kashrut, Jewish dietary laws, both in the home and outside. Secondly, the observance of Sabbaths and holidays. And thirdly, the observance of Taharata Mishpacha, a laws of family purity. The Eastern European immigrants who came to North America, by and large, did observe Kashrut. They were practitioners of this. Uh, and certainly in their homes, by and large, they did uh, observe certain elements of Jewish dietary laws. But they were anxious to participate in North American Jewish life or in American Jewish life. 
And it's vital to note that when it came to issues like the Sabbath, in large measure because of economic necessity, many of these people began very early on to work even on Saturday. Now, I mention this because there was genuine economic necessity. But if one were to compare them, for example, to the Hungarian Orthodox Jews who came to the United States in 1944, 45, 46, post-Holocaust, those Hungarian Orthodox Jews who came, and my lecture tonight is not on the revitalization of Orthodox Judaism in the latter part of the 20th century, were Orthodox in an elite sense. If you had said to these Jews, work on Saturday or starve, they would have chosen starvation. That was not true of people like my grandparents and your grandparents. When the issue came to be one of economic necessity, they were prepared to work on Saturday. That is to say they were practitioners of a folk Judaism that included Shabbat, but observance began to fall off very quickly. And finally, with the issue of Tarat to Mishpacha, the laws of family purity, for any Orthodox Jew who is completely observant of Jewish law, <laughs> these laws of family purity constitute an integral part of any Orthodox Jewish lifestyle. What this means is that in practical terms, and I won't go through all the details of it, but it means that every month when um, a woman has her period, for the time of her menstrual flow, she and her husband are not permitted to touch one another. At the end of her menstrual flow, she counts seven days, and she then goes to a mikvah, a ritual bath, in order to... Uh, engage in tahara, purification, and then she and her husband are permitted the other two weeks of the month, more or less, I'll let you do the biology here, to engage in uh, sexual relations with one another. If one does want to understand why in certain ultra-Orthodox circles you have such a high birth rate, this is sort of the opposite of the rhythm method. It means that husbands and wives are intimate with one another during the period of the month when the wife is probably most fertile. I bring this up because at one point, and Charles Liebman, an Orthodox sociologist who taught at Bar Ilan and Yeshiva universities, did an historical study. At one point, there were over a million Jews who lived on the east side of New York in the 1890s and the early decades of the 1900s. And I'll get to the real point about this in a moment. He noted that at that point there were approximately 224 mikvaot, ritual baths on the Lower East Side. Given that you had over 200,000, over 250, closer to 300,000 couples, and when one observes the laws of family purity, the wife goes to the mikvah only after nightfall. He calculated that if these 250,000 couples had been going or the wives, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, these 224 mikvahot still could not have uh, allowed all of these wives and women to observe these laws. The key point I want to make is the following. We think that our ancestors were by and large orthodox. What I am attempting to tell you, and the reason why this is a significant point, is that they were traditional, they had different attitudes that I'm going to talk about in a moment that distinguish them from their German Jewish compatriots who came here before. But what is important to note is that these people were practitioners of a folk Eastern European Judaism, and they were not, they were not Shomrei Mitzvot, they were not observers of commandments in a strictly halachic Orthodox sense. I say this. Because as we talk about Reform Judaism, and later, by extension, conservative Judaism, what will be important for you to note is how is it, if all of these people were Orthodox, why did all of their children, or so many of their children, an overwhelming percentage, end up in conservative and Reform congregations? The key point I want to make is that the chief cultural characteristic of all Jews who immigrated to the United States, whether the German Jews in the 19th century or the Eastern European Jews in the 20th, to quote my teacher, the late Arthur Hertzberg, these people did not walk, 
They ran out of the ghettos. They wanted to participate in Western life and in American life. Their desire was to acculturate and to receive every blessing that North America would bring them. And the key point to note is that these Eastern European Jews and their children and then their grandchildren begin to enter during the course of the 20th century reform congregations. And as they come into reform congregations and as one considers the Pittsburgh platform with its elevated sense of universalism, which remains relevant to us even today, I would contend, one has to note that they brought different folk attitudes with them that distinguished them from their German-Jewish cousins who came before them. And I just want you to bracket that for one moment because the key issue in part that I want to talk about in the early part of the 20th century is how is it that these Eastern European Jews, as their children and grandchildren, began to enter into conservative and later reform congregations, how did that create change in the reform movement itself from what were the tenets and even practices of classical reform Judaism as articulated in the Pittsburgh platform of 1885. I won't go back over that platform tonight. You've dealt with it at great length, but I want you to keep in mind that the Eastern European Jews had a proclivity towards acculturation, and they were not genuinely orthodox. They were practitioners of a folk Judaism. What did that mean? It meant that for them there were certain rituals to which they were committed. One of the major rituals, of course, would be bar mitzvah later on in the century. As notions of feminism began to arise, that would extend to bat mitzvah as well. But the institution of bar mitzvah in reform congregations, as opposed to a complete emphasis on confirmation, is a reflection of the kind of folk ritual attitudes that these Eastern European Jews brought with them. They had different attitudes towards ritual garb, and we can get into those things in a moment. They also had different attitudes, by and large, to questions of Zionism and Jewish nationalism. While they had not chosen to make Aliyah to Israel, nevertheless, they viewed the rebirth of the Jewish people in our ancestral homeland in a positive kind of way. And hence, it is important to note that these people, as they entered ultimately into reform congregations, brought different attitudes with them. So just to summarize quickly, the Eastern European Jews were inclined to become acculturated into American life. They brought some different ritual and nationalistic attitudes towards Judaism with them as they began to Americanize. But the success of their Americanization is that many of these people began to enter ultimately into conservative and reform congregations and did not remain within the boundaries of the Orthodox world in which they had been raised in uh, Eastern Europe. Now there was leadership that began to articulate some of these differences in the reform movement. And I want to focus on two people in the early part of the 20th century in particular. One was, of course, or is, of course, Rabbi Stephen S. Wise. Uh, Rabbi Stephen S. Wise ultimately would be the founder of the Jewish Institute of Religion. I had the great privilege for many years of being, of course, the president of a school that has a title where the name just trips off the tongue. Uh, the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. Rabbi Wise's father was a graduate of the Jewish Theological Seminary in Central Europe. He came to the United States. He was the rabbi at B'nai Jeshurun on the west side. Uh, he was, in quotes, an uptown Jew. He was the social equal of the Lewis Marshalls and the people who really played significant roles at Temple Emanuel and who were really part of an oligarchy that, by and large, controlled all the institutions of American Jewish life at the beginning of the 20th century. Stephen S. Wise attended Columbia College. He went to Columbia College in 1892. He was 18 years old at a time when I will just tell you Jews did not go to Columbia College. Uh, there were very strict quotas and the types of Jewish boys who were being educated and they were mostly boys <laughs> at 
of that period, if they went to any university or college, it was, of course, what? The City College of New York, not Columbia. The fact that Wise went to Columbia is already an indication of the status that he held. He elected ultimately not to go to the rabbinical school at Hebrew Union College. He was an ardent Zionist uh, and believed very much in Jewish nationalism. By 1900, the head of Hebrew Union College after Isaac Mayer Wise was Kaufman Kohler. Kaufman Kohler was a rabid anti-Zionist. He uh, fired every faculty member at the Hebrew Union College in the first decade of the 1900s who was sympathetic to Jewish nationalism. In fact, I think this week, those of you who uh, were here and heard Rabbi Michael Marmer speak, Rabbi Marmer read Judah Magnus's writings that were delivered from this pulpit condemning Kaufman Kohler for his anti-Zionist attitudes. Magnus served here for several years and Rabbi Magnus ultimately became the chancellor and founder of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He was uh, quite committed to Zionism and he and Kohler disagreed with one another on this issue 100% with one another. Wise also disagreed and for that reason Wise would not attend Hebrew Union College but in the end received private rabbinical ordination. <laughs> he ultimately went to Portland, Oregon in the first decade of the 1900s, and he also completed a PhD degree at Columbia University. So he had sort of impeccable kinds of academic and religious credentials. In Portland, he became quite active in progressivist political causes. Uh, Wise was actually responsible for Oregon enacting the very first child labor law legislation in the United States. He was a great advocate of the progressive income tax, uh, the direct election of United States senators. He became a founder of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. He was a great, great liberal. In 1907, Lewis Marshall and the board of Temple Emanuel approached Rabbi Wise. He had become the most prominent rabbi in North America and therefore the most prominent congregation in America. Emanuel naturally wanted Rabbi Wise to be its rabbi. They only had one problem with him. Uh, how should I put this? They liked his prominence. They just didn't like what he had to say. Uh, and they asserted that they would have to look at his sermons uh, prior to his delivering them. Now, there is a great degree of historical debate over this. Uh, some people think that Wise invented this because he really did not want to come to Emmanuel. He and Marshall, who was also serving then, Lewis Marshall, as the chair of the board at the Jewish Theological Seminary, just in an ancillary note you are probably aware in this congregation that all the money and all the leadership that went into the building of the Jewish Theological Seminary came from the membership of Congregation Emanuel of New York. It was due to Ox, Sulzberger, Lewis Marshall that Solomon Schechter was brought to the United States and the seminary, while it was officially established in 1886, was really born in 1902 when Solomon Schechter came. Because we're talking about reform tonight, I won't give a lecture on Schechter, but you should note he was a person before he became a day school, uh, is the way I would phrase it. Uh, Marshall and Wise were kind of like oil and water with one another. As a result of Stephen S. Wise's rejection of this pulpit, either rejection by or rejection of, he created a synagogue across the park called the Free Synagogue. And what did free mean for Stephen S. Wise? This isn't a rhetorical question. What do you think it meant? No dues? Freedom of speech from the pulpit. Believe me, he didn't mean no dues. By the way, there was also free seating. People could sit anywhere they wanted when they came in. But in addition, what he really meant was freedom of the pulpit. Namely, he, Stephen S. Wise, was free to say whatever he wanted. Uh, and he became this great orator and significant figure. He became the most important figure 
in North America in support of uh, American Zionism. By the way, one other thing I would add, and again, I think at Emmanuel, people should be aware of this, the founder of the Zionist Organization of America uh, were really the Gottiles, father and son. One was the rabbi here at Emmanuel, and the other was a professor at Columbia University. One of the great ironies of American Zionist history is that while the reform movement in an official way in the early part of the 20th century was anti-nationalist, all the great leaders of American Zionism, or the greatest leaders, Louis Brandeis, Stephen S. Wise, Abba Hillel Silver, were all reform Jews or reform rabbis, or Rabbi Gatil, who was the rabbi here. In fact, Hadassah owes its origins here. Uh, it began in the basement of this congregation uh, with Mrs. Gatil playing a significant role in hosting uh, what would ultimately emerge as Hadassah. So it's an interesting kind of historical development in this sort of way. Stephen S. Wise also created uh, the American Jewish Congress. He was opposed to the committee, which of course was populated by people like Marshall because he thought it was too oligarchic, not democratic enough. There was, uh, how should I put it, a lot of bad blood between uh, Stephen S. Wise and members of his own class. But what it began to reflect were changes that would begin to take place in the reform movement. While the Pittsburgh platform took what would have to be described as an anti-nationalistic st stance <laughs> in regard to the rebirth of a Jewish state in the Zionist movement. Wise and others were absolute proponents of it. And Wise also became, of course, the most prominent reform rabbi in North America. He was president of the Central Conference of American Rabbis and in ritual practice, I do want to emphasize this, he was by anyone's standards, classical reform. He was not ritualistically oriented or observant, but he was tolerant of ritual observance. He had grown up with a great deal himself. He had no use for it personally, but it did not disturb him if other people found it meaningful. And in fact, his rabbinical school, the Jewish Institute of Religion, was committed to issues of social justice, social action, um, committed very, very much to Zionism, uh, and these were really his two major commitments. Where people stood ritualistically was virtually irrelevant to Stephen S. Wise. They could be observant or non-observant. It was of virtually no uh, import to him whatsoever. As people like Wise and then later, the son of a butcher from the Bronx, Abba Hillel Silver, entered the Hebrew Union College and became such a significant rabbi in the Midwest uh, at the temple in Cleveland, uh, these people began to change the reform movement. There was also a man named Solomon Kohan. Solomon Kohan, who came to the Hebrew Union College in 1923. While Kaufman Kohler had forbade modern Hebrew literature to be taught at HUC, he forbade it to be taught because Kohler regarded it as a nationalistic literature. When Kohan came, he organized a modern Hebrew-speaking club and began to teach Hebrew literature. <laughs> in 1937, in Columbus, and this is a very significant development in the history of reform, the reform rabbinate adopted its second platform. While the Pittsburgh platform had been 52 years earlier, the Columbus platform took a positive attitude towards Zionism. And it said that it was a mitzvah, as it were, a commandment, an obligation on the part of Jews to engage in the rebuilding of the Jewish state. There's a complex history around this document, as with all documents. But I think what becomes important to note is that the reform movement has now begun to evolve. The anti-nationalism that had marked it during its late 19th century, early 20th century period began to be modified, and this is because of the leadership of people like Rabbi Wise, Rabbi Silver, Rabbi Kohan, but it is also because as the children and grandchildren of these Eastern European immigrants began to acculturate and be successful in American life, more and more of them began to actually enter 
reform congregations. It indicates two things. One, the immigrants themselves and their children were now engaged in successful acculturation. Had they not been successfully acculturated, they would not have been inclined to enter reform congregations, nor would they have felt comfortable there. So it means that they had changed, but in addition, they brought with them different attitudes towards ritual and other sorts of issues. And you begin to see the reform movement changing as well. So that would be the key point up to this juncture. So the way in which I've tried to outline this is that first you have an Eastern European Jewish population that is inclined towards acculturation in American life. You have leadership <laughs> with provided by people like Stephen S. Wise, Abba Hillel Silver, Solomon, uh, Samson Kohan, uh, Samuel Kohan, excuse me, Samson, Samuel, Solomon, they're run into one another, but Samuel Kohan. And as these people begin to enter the movement, they begin to have a significant impact on the rabbinic leadership of the movement. And the movement itself begins to have different attitudes towards many questions of the day. You begin to see this evolution. Then you have the Holocaust. In 1938, the Zionist Organization of America numbered 6,000 people. That's how many members there were of the ZOA. In 1944, the ZOA numbered over 450,000 members. For purposes of this lecture, I want to make the following point. While there continued to be debate in reform circles about the, how should I phrase it, the kashrut of Zionism, on practical level, Adolf Hitler ended the debate. Even if American Jews did not want themselves to make Aliyah to Israel, as the news of the Holocaust began to be disseminated, virtually all Jews in the United States began to feel that at least for our dispossessed brothers and sisters, there needs to be a homeland for the Jewish people where the Jewish people uh, can be defended. The Holocaust did not create Zionism, but the Holocaust ended the debate on a practical level about whether Zionism and the rebirth of a Jewish state should be an inherent or central Jewish commitment. For an organization to grow from 6,000 to over 450,000 members in a period of six years begins to give you a reflection of how attitudes had begun to change in the North American Jewish community during that period. The 1950s witness, after World War II, a tremendous growth in churches and synagogues in, in North America. For the first time, by the way, and particularly under President Eisenhower, when you begin to have highways that are built, Jews begin to leave peer areas of first and second settlement, the Lower East Side, Queens, and they begin to move out to suburbs, whether it be Westchester, New Jersey, etc. Much easier to get around. As people enter into suburban life, part of what begins to occur is that people belong to churches and synagogues. Will Herberg, who taught at uh, Drew University, wrote a very famous book called Protestant Catholic Jew. And this book, written in 1954, indicates that Jews as a religion were now an integral part of North American society. We were one of the three great religious traditions in North America, even if our numbers, compared to Protestants and Catholics, were relatively minuscule. And synagogues begin to burgeon during this period. And you have a tremendous, tremendous growth, and this represents a great growth, uh, not only in the reform, but certainly the conservative movement as well. During this period, frankly, the conservative movement it becomes the largest movement in North America. But what also comes to be important is that reform congregations are growing as well as the children and grandchildren of many of these Eastern European Jews come into the United States. 
We now get to the 1960s, and these attitudes begin to crystallize and galvanize in significantly new ways. Two major events occur. One is the 1967 war, the Six-Day War in Israel, the perceived miraculous victory on the part of the Israelis when there was tremendous fear that the state of Israel would be destroyed, brought even greater pride on the part of countless numbers of Jews in the state of Israel and what the reborn Jewish state meant. Again, whatever debate there had been over Zionism on practical, practical levels began to change during this period. It is not a mistake that it's during this period that Nelson Glick and the Hebrew Union College are given land in Jerusalem to create a branch of Hebrew Union College uh, there by 1970. It becomes a requirement for everyone who will serve you as a rabbi or a cantor in a reform congregation that they have to take a required year of study in Israel because the movement and the Board of Governors of the Hebrew Union College come to the position that if someone is going to be a leader among the Jewish people, they need at the very least a first-hand acquaintance with the reality of Jewish peoplehood as is expressed in the life of the newborn Jewish state. Kaufman Kohler would not have opposed this. He is, I am sure, doing somersaults right now uh, in his grave as he considers the directions that the reform movement has taken uh, on this issue. But what you also have, and this will become significant, is the rise of a new ethnicity. And this I want to pay attention to. So we've talked about cultural characteristics of the Eastern European Jews, the leadership supplied by people like Stephen Wise and Abba Hillel Silver, the impact of the Holocaust, and then the miraculous victory, seemingly miraculous victory and the reunification of Jerusalem in 1967. All of these have had impacts on American Judaism in general and certainly the reform movement. <laughs> But what you also begin to get is the rise of a new, what scholars, sociologists in the 60s call the new ethnicity. This is during the time of Vietnam. And let me see if I can capture this. The new ethnicity is different than the old ethnicity. People like my grandparents who came from Eastern Europe, they were the, in quotes, old ethnics. That is to say, people like my grandfather, grandmothers, spoke what I would call Yinglish. Uh, it was an admixture of Yiddish and English. One didn't have to ask them about their Jewish commitments. It's precisely who they were in the world. By the time you get to their grandchildren, my generation, we cannot be ethnic the way our grandparents were. We grew up in a completely different kind of world. I grew up, in quotes, in Virginia as an American. Uh, the new ethnicity, though, comes to view in many ways the ethnicity of the grandparents in something like romantic terms. And part of what Vietnam does is the following. It shakes the self-confidence of, I would call it, the dominant Protestant ethos in North America. Think of history courses that you took, and I'm 66. I can tell you every world history course I took. This is how the course went. There was a man named Abraham who lived in the Fertile Crescent, and he created ethical monotheism. And that really was the Jews' great gift to Western civilization. By the way, after that, the Jews end. The reason why Toynbee will call us a fossil isn't the Jews don't exist. That's the end of Jewish contributions. You then move to Greece the classical Greek and Roman heritage. We all studied that in school. You then move to the birth of Christianity. When you come to the Middle Ages, what are the Middle Ages like? What do we call them? Again, not a trick question. What were the, the Dark Ages? Had you grown up in an Islamic country, they wouldn't have been called the Dark Ages. They would have been called the Golden Age. And then you move to the birth of Protestantism, mercantilism, the time of revolutions, etc. Jews don't appear in the story, women don't appear in the story, African Americans don't appear in the story, Hispanics don't appear in the story. Part of what begins to occur in the 1960s, and this will have an impact on Jewish identity and the reform movement as well, <coughs> is that 
the new ethnicity does not reject the notion that persons want to participate in and receive the complete blessings of North American society, American society. But it means that people begin to think, if what you want to do is to understand what does it mean to be a human being, that it is important to read Emerson and Thoreau and the literature of the New England Transcendentalist. But it may be that you need to take broader testimony. This is multiculturalism at its best, not at its worst, at its best. And you begin to have the rise of African black power studies in American universities during that period. And you begin to have the growth of Hispanic studies, women's studies. And you begin to have the growth of Jewish studies during this period prior to the 1960s, outside of the seminaries, Hebrew Union College, the Jewish Theological Seminary, Yeshiva University, the only place you could study Judaica in a secular university. Harry Wilson taught philosophy at Harvard, and Salo Barone and Joseph Blau taught Judaic studies at Columbia. The reason in my generation such a disproportionate number of scholars have their PhDs from Columbia is because Columbia, through Barone, became the center of Jewish academic studies during this, uh, during this period of American academic history. Jews remained, up to this point, somewhat excluded from North American Jewish life. The first Jew, for example, to ever teach English at a North American elite university was Lionel Trilling in 1938 at Columbia. How could anyone whose roots were so shallow in Anglo-Saxon culture possibly be a professor of English literature American history? I always tell the story in my family. My father, who graduated the College of William and Mary, wanted to become a professor of British history. He was told by his teacher at William and Mary, as a Jew, you will never get a job teaching British history. And my father ended up as a consolation prize going to Harvard Law School and was an attorney. But he always said, but to be really significant, you have to become a professor. Uh, my father used to also say, anybody can make money, but to be a professor, of course, I later realized in life, he must have had money at that point in his life if he could say it in that, uh, that regard. I am trying to paint a larger picture of what begins to occur because what finally happens now is that there comes to be a great new ethnic appreciation and you begin to have a Havara movement where you have young people in my generation who begin to explore Judaism in, uh, in significant ways since we're talking about the Jewish question and many of these people come to Hebrew Union College. The key point I want to make about the reform movement is that reform has begun to evolve but these are people who have much different attitudes towards ritual, towards the state of Israel, and all of these changes and transformations will come to be manifest in the beliefs and practices of people who attend HUC. In my class in New York in 1977, of the 15 graduates of the New York school that year, 11 had kosher homes. I can assure you that was not the case I don't know if it was the case in Cincinnati. I'll let David Posner testify to that. But I can assure you that would not have been the case even in New York a decade earlier. All of this is a reflection of some of the changes that are beginning to occur. I am not attempting to say that you have a reformed Judaism that is remotely orthodox or halachic, but what you do begin to have is that reformed Jews begin to say, we are able to explore the ritual elements of Jewish tradition to see if, in a personal way, they can provide a sense of meaning in our life, and they begin to change, in some ways, the trajectory of North American Jewish life. Now, I want to make one other point that begins to emerge here. There are a lot of variants or variables that have to be considered. It is only during this period that interfaith marriage begins to enter the North American Jewish community. If you know anyone intermarried prior to 1960, from a sociological standpoint, that is a rare act. I could choose words that sociologists use, but they might sound too pejorative. There are two variables that have to be present for any minority group 
to have a significant incidence of intermarriage. For a minority group to have high rates of intermarriage, two factors have to be present. Members of the minority group have to be thoroughly acculturated into the mores of the larger host culture. But what else has to be present? Why is it that in 1942 he did not? But if my father had wanted to date or my mother non-Jews in 1942, why would that likely not have occurred? I mean, I have to be honest, I don't think they thought about it. But why couldn't that have occurred even if they had wanted it to, by and large, in a sociologically significant number? Because what else has to be present if members of a minority group are going to have a significant rate of exogamy, outmarriage? It isn't only that the minority group has to be acculturated, but what does the majority culture have to feel about the minority group? They have to feel that members of that minority group are a desirable marriage partner. By the way, today, just parenthetically to throw it in, the highest rate of exogamy of any minority group in the United States today are Indian Hindus. They marry people who are non-Indian Hindus in the United States over the last 10 years at almost an 80% rate. They go to Williams and Colgate and Harvard and Yale and Columbia and they meet non-Hindu, non-Indians and they end up marrying them. They have a higher rate of intermarriage than Jews have. Jews are second to Hindus, Hindu Indians, in uh, the rates of intermarriage. For any minority group to have this, then, these are the factors that need to be present. And the reason why this is significant, in the 1970 National Jewish Population Study, the Jewish rate of intermarriage hit about 30%. So almost one out of three Jews getting married between 1965 and 1970 married someone born non-Jewish for the first time you begin to have, sociologically speaking, significant amounts of intermarriage. By 1990, that rate hits about 50 percent, and by 2014, as the Pew study indicated, for non-Orthodox Jews, what's the rate of intermarriage? For non-Orthodox Jews in the recent Pew study, 71 percent. Seven out of ten of our children in this congregation or any non-Orthodox setting will marry people born non-Jewish. does not mean that the non-Jews will not come to be part of the Jewish community through conversion or through uh, other uh, familial uh, propoquinity, but it is important to note that you have a community that is ethnically completely transformed. So the irony is that just at the point where there begins to be a greater emphasis on what one might call particularity within the Jewish community, the other reality is that sociologically, Jews are beginning to not only socialize with non-Jews, they're beginning to marry non-Jews, and non-Jews are coming to be part of Jewish families. This represents significant change. One other figure that I would give you, in the 1990 population study, there were approximately 1.3 million Reformed Jews. That is to say, 1.3 million people checked off that they were Reform. How many of these 1.3 million Reformed Jews do you think said they had grown up in conservative congregations? Any idea? 750,000. More than half the people who claimed to be reformed grew up in conservative congregations. Let me just ask a question here tonight. Just, this is not a scientific survey. How many of you belong either to a manual or another reformed congregation? How many of you have parents who were reformed? How many have parents who belong to conservative congregations? Well, you can just take a look around this room and you begin to get a notion of what some of these uh, changes have been within the reform movement. It shows you that there comes to be a steady immigration into the reform movement of people who grew up in the conservative movement with conservative attitudes and at the same time their coming to reform congregations indicates some of the transformation that's taken place. Let me then having described some of the events of the 20th century, just one other statistic I do want to give you. 
In the 1980s, a survey was taken by Gallup asking white non-Jews the following question. How would you feel if your child married a Jew? And there were four possible answers. One, I'd be extremely happy. Two, it would be fine. Three, I wouldn't like it, but it would be okay. And four, I would really hate it. This is a figure that in general surprises Jews because of our history. But I am curious to note, and anyone can yell this out, what percentage do you think said I'd be elated, as it were, if my child married a Jew? Yeah, 22%. What percentage do you think said it would really be fine with me? Almost 60%. Only 14% said they would be unhappy if their child married a Jew. To quote Professor Brodkin, a woman who teaches at UCLA, she has written an important book entitled How Jews Became White Folk and What That Says About Race in America. Positions that Jews could not hold their acceptance into non-Jewish families, all of this changed. We have a community that is ethnically heterogeneous in a way that we never have had it before. And every position in North America that did not used to be open to Jews virtually is. I don't know the exact numbers, but I can tell you, go to any significant university in the United States and look at their Department of American History and English Literature, I promise you, 50% of the professors are likely to be Jewish. Organizations or institutions like DuPont that uh, would never have had a Jewish chief executive have CEOs or did with names like Shapiro. Ivy League colleges and universities where it would have been unthinkable for Jews even to be admitted in significant numbers go down the list now and consider how many of them have presidents who are not only Jewish men, but in many cases, Amy Gutman and others, Jewish women. I mean, the world has really changed uh, in significant ways, and all of these things have had impacts on American Judaism in general, and certainly Reform Judaism in particular. So now let me try to describe what else it is that I think is going on, and I'm going to try to bring this to an end. The key point I've been trying to make is that if you want to understand directions in Reform Judaism and where we're likely to go, you need to know our history and you need to know the so larger social context in which Jews live. And now I want to talk about a book by a man named Peter Berger. Berger is not Jewish. He's a professor at Boston University and perhaps the most prominent sociologist of religion in America. I want to talk about two of his books because they'll illustrate what our challenge is as we move to the future. One of his books is entitled The Heretical Imperative. By the way, each section of this talk tonight is about two classes in a seminar in a semester long class. One of his books that I would mention is called The Heretical Imperative. And this is the point he makes. The word heresy or heretical has as its etymological root the word heretical, the Greek word heresis, meaning choice or option. The nature of modernity is that choices and options are inescapable. They are inescapable. That we live in a world where the choices and options open before people increase at dizzying paces. Berger, by the way, I just want to indicate, writes often for Commentary magazine. He is, by any standard, on a personal level, what one would call a neoconservative. He does not like what he describes. I mean, I want to be blunt about that or frank about it. But he says, the nature of the modern world is that modernity falsifies tradition. People leave their native places. They're presented with numerous options and they make all kinds of choices. Just think, uh, I mean, I grew up in an Orthodox family in Newport News, Virginia. My father might have been able to imagine that one day I would become a Reform rabbi. Wouldn't have been so happy, was not so happy about it, but he could have imagined it. 
I don't know if it was mentioned in my introduction, but I'm not only a rabbi, but for those of you who know me, I am a Rebetzin. My wife is a rabbi. If you had told my father in 1965 when I graduated high school, David's not only going to grow up to be a reform rabbi, he's going to marry a woman rabbi. Of course, today I could be marrying a male rabbi. I mean, this just represents the kind of shifts and options the nature of modernity is that it presents choices in dizzying kinds of ways. And what does that do? Berger comes to another book called The Homeless Mind. The Homeless Mind. And now consider the demographics of the Jewish community. Here in New York, it may be different. How many of you grew up in New York? Just raise your hands. How many of you moved here from elsewhere? Well, that's significant, more than I would have thought. The Jewish community was transformed. There is no community, sub-community in America that is as mobile as the Jews. A place like Los Angeles, where I lived for 23 years, had 50,000 Jews in 1950, today over 600,000. Dallas, Texas, Miami, Florida, Atlanta. I could go into Phoenix, Arizona, numbered 30,000 Jews in 1970. Probably over 200,000 Jews live in Phoenix today. These are, in many ways, brand new communities. What is it that happens in a world of heretical imperatives? Where I grew up in Newport News, my father had five brothers and sisters. We all lived on a street called Oak Avenue. I was with my aunts and uncles and my cousins every day of my life. It was wonderful, and I would also tell you it was confining. Had I stayed in that community, I'm pretty sure I know the synagogue I belong to, and I probably even know many of the friends that I would have. Part of what modernity does is that it attenuates traditional kinship and relational patterns. And what does that mean when people go to Phoenix, Arizona, Denver, Colorado, Los Angeles, California, and this is the impact on congregations, part of what occurs is that there's no longer an Aunt Bessie or an Uncle Jaime who lived right across the street from me, to say, where are you going to be on Erev Yom Kippur? And people go, and they marry who they love, and they either come or don't come to synagogues. What we saw in the Pew study, the highest, fastest growing denomination in American life, Jewish life, are just non-affiliated. They are growing far faster than the Orthodox. But the other point, and this is the key element, I think, of hope as we view the future, is that for some people, when they go to that Phoenix, Arizona, or the Upper East Side or the Upper West Side, they no longer have the constraints of family that brings them into synagogue or Jewish life. But for many people, what is it they want? They want a sense of home and they want, to be, they want community. How did that song go for Cheers? I want to go somewhere where everybody knows my name. In a world of incredible anonymity, Part of what you get in Jewish life today is a renaissance that is unparalleled uh, in Judaism. We have record numbers of people going to birthright. 94% of people surveyed in Pew said they were proud of being Jewish. Many of them not even raised Jewishly, but they're proud of being Jewish. We have record numbers of people going to day schools. We have more people studying Judaic studies on an advanced level than ever before. The core of American Jewish life and of the reform movement is healthier than ever. Go to the biennial and you would never know anything remotely was wrong with reform Judaism. It looks like the healthiest movement in the entire world. The key point I want to make here is that what you have in North American Jewish life today and in the reform movement are antipodian trends. Antipodian trends. Think of the antipodes on a battery where the currents run in opposite directions. We have tremendous challenges with assimilation, non-affiliation, non-observance, and we also have significant numbers of our population who are more concerned with leading meaningful Jewish lives than ever was true before. For people like my parents, their being Jewish was what, again to quote sociologist Robert Bella, was a habit of the heart. They were the children of immigrants. Being Jewish didn't require much thought on their part. To quote Bella's later book, we live in an area now, an era of Sheilaism, meaning what is it that I, Sheila, want? We live in an area of autonomy, but what do people want? People still want meaning. People want community. 
People want purpose. They want to participate in the repair of the world. Human beings need a sense of belonging. And the challenge for reform in light of all these changes that I've outlined tonight is how is, the, how is it that we as a movement create congregations, synagogues, community that will allow people to feel that they are recognized, that they are known, that they are valued, that they can contribute to the world, and that the ideals that have guided our movement for the last 200 years are ones that can inspire them to create community. When I look to the beginning of the book of Bereshit, and I'll conclude with two quotes, one from the Hebrew Bible and one from a 20th century professor, I always try to imagine what does it mean to be created in the image of God? And how is it that we can lead our lives and create our communities so that our children, so to speak, would be proud of us and find our communities meaningful? And here I think what it means to engage in imitatio dei, the image of God and the imitation of God's work in the world is Note how the Bible begins. Bereshit bara Elohim et hashemayim v'yata aretz. In the beginning, God creates the heaven and earth. Varetz haita tohu vavohu v'choshech al pnei tohom. In the beginning, all there is is chaos, and darkness is over the face of the deep. Baruach Elohim rachefet al pnei amayim, and God's presence hovers over the waters, and God says, Yehi or, let there be light. By a heat or and there is light. God creates light out of darkness. God creates order out of chaos. God creates community. God creates community out of chaos. And the task that we confront, and why I remain confident, is that what it means to act in a godlike way is for us to engage as God did. Human beings are meaning-seeking creatures. Human beings are social. We want a sense of community. We want a sense of belonging. We want to feel that we're part of a rooted tradition. And Judaism has infinite resources to be able to speak to this both internally to our community and externally to the larger world. That, by the way, is why the teachings of the Society for Classical Reform Judaism are, in my view, particularly significant, because they remind us in an age when we want to talk about the particularism of our community that our Jewish tradition instructs us, commands us, bids us to also look out to the larger world. And reform, I believe, can do this, particularly in an age where there's such a high rate of intermarriage. If the reform movement does not succeed in this, there will not be large numbers of Jewish people in the latter part of the 21st century. And here, then, I would end with a teaching of Shimon Ravidovich. If you spell that name correctly, you get extra points on the exam. Ravidovich, R-A-W-I-D-O-W-I-C-Z. Ravidovich was the first head of the Nedges Department, Near Eastern and Judaic Studies, at Brandeis University. He was a colossal scholar. But one essay of his that I would mention, and in fact, my friend Jonathan Sarna quotes this at the end of his book on American Judaism. He wrote an essay entitled The Ever-Dying People. The Ever-Dying People. And he points out that one of the key tropes in Jewish history is that every generation of Jews believes we are the Sherita Pleta, we are the last saving remnant. And after me, there's not going to be any more Judaism. But because every Jewish generation has confronted that challenge and attempted to respond to it in meaningful cadences and in meaningful ways, the Jewish people have always been dying, but the converse is also true. We've always been alive. And therefore, the actions that we take to respond to the current situation in which we find ourselves and the attempt to create meaningful community that will allow people in this world of heretical imperatives with the heritage we have to find a meaningful sense of being in the world can be, in my opinion, in creative hands like those of Rabbi Davidson and your staff here, at a manual, I think Judaism can continue to speak uh, in significant ways to large numbers of Jews as we enter into the 21st century. And therefore, I remain optimistic 
that based on our actions, Reform Judaism can be as vital in the 21st century, perhaps even more so, than it has been in light of these sociological conditions in the past. And in this sense, I would assert that uh, the future of our people really does depend on how we in the liberal Jewish community uh, behave and the leadership that we provide. Again, a lot of topics tonight. I thank you all for listening so attentively and <laughs> open to questions or comments. Any comments, questions? I've probably answered everything, yes. Right. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> well, I think there are two factors. One, my training as a sociologist at Columbia, and two, my training uh, as an Hebraist. In Hebrew, there is a word for assimilation, hebololut, and then there's another term for acculturation, liot meshulav betarbut, to be acculturated. When persons in a minority group enter into a larger culture, they begin the process of acculturation. The ultimate extreme, as sociologists would define it, of acculturation is assimilation. Technically, assimilation means that you are so acculturated that all your ties to your group of origin have been eliminated. The truth is most Jews in North America are highly, highly acculturated. You cannot understand American Judaism and certainly the reform movement without appreciating the fact that the chief cultural characteristic by and large of most North American Jews uh, is that we are a highly acculturated people. We participate in the larger culture of which we're a part and we desire to do so. But what's interesting is that Judaism... <coughs> Judaism... <coughs> I'll choke on this. Judaism in this context really does not atrophy and die. By the way, in the 19th century, when Jews intermarried, by and large, it meant they left the community. If Jewish intermarriage meant that Jews were going to leave the community completely, we wouldn't have problems with patrilineal descent. People would intermarry and they'd leave. What occurs is people intermarry and they want to still participate in the Jewish community in one way or another. So the term acculturation is meant to capture a process where we recognize, yes, Jews take on the mores of the larger culture of which we're a part, but assimilation is a term that I use purposefully and intentionally to refer to people when they've abandoned their community of origin altogether. Yeah. Yeah, so what programs do we need to take? That is a great question, and I'm going to really say that uh, I hope you'll have Rabbi Pankin here to indicate what it is the Hebrew Union College, uh, college should do, uh, and certainly Rabbi Davids. I think that there are numerous programs that we need to take. I mean, to begin with, in an open society, the best Jews can hope for is a common landscape. There is not a solution to this issue. I mean, I always tell my students, if you think that you can articulate the solution to the challenge of acculturation for Jews, you are doomed to disappointment. Uh, to quote President Bush, let there be a thousand rays of light. That is to say, I think different people will respond to, uh, to different stimuli in this regard. And Judaism has a very broad heritage. Some people will enjoy mysticism. Some people will like the classical music of Lewandowski. Uh, some people will be interested in areas of meditation. Others will look to Jewish social action. I don't think there's any one way. What I do think is that congregations this size are uniquely suited to provide a broad array of answers that, frankly, smaller congregations cannot. I know that there was a time when I lived in L.A. 
And if I would go to Stephen Wise congregation there that numbered over 3,000 families, what was interesting to me was that you had a dozen different things going on on a Saturday morning. There were different minyanim. Some were organized principally for bar bat mitzvah. They had a tat shabbat. Uh, they had programs for teenagers. Now, I want to be fair. This cost a lot of money. You have to have a lot of staff if you're going to run multiple programs. Larger congregations tend to be in a better position to do this than smaller congregations. You can run, what, what's that term they use for movie theaters, a multiplex? You can run a kind of multiplex kind of synagogue. At the college, we attempt in all sorts of ways to create new programs. I mean, for example, uh, due to the work of Aaron Pankin and others, we have uh, significant outreach programs uh, for our students during the course of their training as rabbis and canners. What does that mean? <coughs> <coughs> Every single student before they leave the Hebrew Union College goes on uh, weekends and internships where they work with what we call or identify as outreach rabbis. They meet with people who are intermarried. Uh, they get a larger and better sense about how to work with such people uh, because in reality these are going to be the people whom they're going to be serving uh, as rabbis and canners. So we have a tremendous emphasis upon this. Now, in our practical rabbinics curriculum, we emphasize issues of chaplaincy in ways that were not true during my uh, years at the College Institute. And what we're attempting to do is to create programs, too, where we have people who go into the chaplaincy, who work in Hillel. Uh, one of the challenges we have at HUC is that almost 90% of our students elect congregations. That's good on one level. But on another level, the needs of reformed Jewish youngsters and unaffiliated youngsters on the college campuses, persons in hospitals, our soldiers in the military, we need more liberal rabbis there as well. So these are among the ways in which we, uh, in which we attempt to respond to this challenge. But obviously, there is no one single answer. There was a hand in the back. Dr. Yes. Oh, Dr. Posner. OK, my eyes aren't as good. Wow. Well, that's a good historical uh, reminiscence. Would you comment on what the sociologists call secularization thesis that modernity brings uh, inevitably secularization? Of course, uh, religious one. Yeah. Secularization, as sociologists understand it, does not mean that religion disappears. Secularization means that religion comes to inform fewer and fewer aspects of a person's life. So, for example, in the classical code of Jewish law, the Shulchan Orach, it begins with the frontispiece. The motto is, Shivisi Hashem Lenegdi Tamid. I place God before me always. So that in a non-secular society, everything you do, the way you put your shoes on, sexual relations, the food you eat, social action, everything comes to be informed by religion. Everything comes to be informed by religion. We obviously live in an age when for most people that we know, fewer and fewer things come to be informed by religion. Uh, there was a great belief when I was in graduate school, certainly in the 70s, that uh, we lived in a predominantly secular age and that religion was doomed to completely disappear. Uh, as with the tales of other people's demise, uh, the death of religion has been grossly exaggerated. Uh, one of the interesting projects, Martin Marty, a professor at the University of Chicago, has published a number of books entitled uh, Fundamentalisms Observed. And one of the things that we've witnessed, certainly at the beginning of the 21st century, is uh, the growth of religious fundamentalism, both in the United States and the Islamic world and in other parts of the world. Uh, in addition, even in liberal circles, uh, 
individuals often come to look to religion for the, the wisdom it can provide. Having said that, where I think you are correct, and this is a challenge for the reform movement, our people by and large, and this is a variant on your notion of secularization, come from what I would either call thin Jewish culture or their encounters with Judaism or what I would call episodic. Last week, a couple times a year, interestingly, I'm always invited to speak at Yeshiva University. So last week I spoke to a group at Yeshiva. There were two interesting data that emerged from there. One I completely expected. These are students who attend Yeshiva College in Stern. Richard Joel always invites me to come. Virtually every single kid I talk to, and it's a group of about 40 undergraduates whom Richard has selected to be presidential assistants, has minimally, prior to entering Yeshiva College or Stern College, 14 to 15 years of Jewish education. They've started in nursery school, they've gone 12 years to Jewish day schools, and they have a year or two at Yeshivot in Israel, and then they enter Yeshiva. They are part of what I would call thick Jewish cultures. They, they know Hebrew, they read texts. To ask them, why do you choose being Jewish, would be a little bit like asking my father why he chose to be, to be Jewish. Having said that, I want to indicate one other factor that I was surprised at. I asked them, how many of you have uncles, aunts, or first cousins who have intermarried? Every single one of them did. That tells me, by the way, how ubiquitous, and now I'll be a sociologist, Jewish exogamy is in the modern world, Jewish intermarriage, that students from these homes and families have aunts, uncles, cousins who are intermarried, tells you how all-encompassing the reality of acculturation is for American Jews. I would not have anticipated that there. And one question that I received from one student who was the editor of the student newspaper was, how is it that as a Jew you can defend uh, the Jewish desire to intermarry? After all, doesn't that represent uh, a betrayal of our universal commitments as human beings. Now this comes from a student at Yeshiva College with 16 years of Jewish education. By the way, my bet will be that of those students, 98% will marry other Jews. But in terms of the intellectual arrangements that are going on in their heads, they are very much part of a modern world that sees the impact of what you would label secularization. The challenge we have is that in a world where 94% of the people interviewed by Pew say they're proud to be Jewish, our challenge in the reform movement is to make meaning of that. In other words, is it simply, well, being Jewish isn't pejorative or negative in any way in our culture, and therefore if I have one Jewish grandparent, I'm willing to say, yeah, I'm Jewish and I'm proud of it because it's inconsequential on one level. But on the other level, it means that there is a potential, a spark, if I were to cite Jewish mystical literature, that could be ignited in the right kinds of circumstances. And that's why the challenge of creating community in our day and allowing the spirit of the divine to speak among our people is so incredibly crucial probably will shock you to know that uh, there is no magical solution to all of these uh, issues. It is much easier to describe the problems than to come up with a universal panacea. In fact, there is no universal panacea. But there are panaceas to this. And for those of us who see Judaism and Jewishness at the center of our life and our being, uh, this is an effort... Uh, to which I've dedicated my life, I will say, and uh, I don't think there could have been uh, any higher or more noble cause. So again, I want to thank Rabbi Davidson and this community for inviting me tonight and before, and I wish all of you a sweet and happy Passover. You know, uh, you, 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 David, talked about the reasons for hope going forward. I, I just want to share with you one more. Uh, the two of us recently returned from Chicago at the gathering of the Central Conference of American Rabbis, and um, 
at one point during that conference, uh, everyone present who uh, was either ordained by uh, Rabbi Ellenson or sat in one of his classes was asked to stand up. And that number reached about two-thirds of those people who were present. And that, the fact that we had the blessing to sit in your class, that's a reason for hope for us going forward. And we are so grateful to you for your leadership and, and know that this won't be the last time that you uh, grace uh, this uh, congregation's lectern. We're so glad that you were with us tonight. I wanted just before you go, um, let you know about a couple of other things coming up that are also uh, very wonderful and follow uh, the discussion this evening. On May 1st at 7 o'clock, Rabbi Dr. Larry Hoffman, HUC's Professor of Liturgy, Worship, and Ritual, will deliver our annual Charles Grossman Lecture in Jewish Intellectual History titled, How We Pray is Who We Are. This is your life, American Jews. And then on May 12th, at 6.30, Rabbi Rick Jacobs, president of our movement, Rabbi Dr. Aaron Pankin, Dr. Ellenson's successor as the president of the College Institute, will together debate with Brandeis sociologist and demographer Dr. Amy Sales, the future of Judaism in this new and changing world. So many wonderful opportunities ahead. David, again, thank you so very, very much.